This video is brought to you by Mubi. Get 30 days for free by going to Mubi.com slash now you see it. Is it possible to two youths? Uh, uh, to what? There's no better test for a filmmaker than the courtroom scene. Think about everything going on in a courtroom scene while a lawyer interrogates a witness. The judge moderates the examination, the other lawyer potentially objects, and the witness answers the questions. That's already a handful of people, and that doesn't even include all the spectators, the accused, the jury, and all the people watching. There's so much going on that some films decide to just simplify the scene. In the first trial scene in A Few Good Men, we get introduced to the jury and the victim's family in the audience, but after that, those characters don't get any more screen time and stay in the background for the rest of the movie. This choice makes sense for the film because it's based on a play, and that play didn't even have a jury or spectators on stage. In plays, the viewer watches from one angle, so there isn't as much space as an actual courtroom. But film doesn't have that limitation. The camera can be anywhere at any time, capturing moments from all the characters within a huge courtroom. The courtroom scenes in A Few Good Men focus on only a few characters, and they're very well shot, but I don't think they show the full potential of a courtroom scene. With so many different perspectives to play up, a courtroom can raise the stakes for many characters at once, which can create some of the most complicated and satisfying scenes in cinema. Many films manage to pull off this narrative complexity, giving each character their own moments while still maintaining spatial and editorial clarity. So how do they do it? The answer depends on the film, but one thing is always clear. A well-shot courtroom scene requires a mastery of several cinematic techniques. So let's take this video to court. All right. All right. All right. The space of the courtroom itself presents a challenge for the filmmaker. A typical scene with dialogue will follow the 180 rule. This rule means that the camera stays on one side of two characters to keep the shot spatially consistent. Some films purposefully break this rule to create disorientation, like in the bathroom scene in The Shining. The camera crosses that imaginary line, and the angle change makes the scene feel more uneasy and dreamlike. But in a scene with more characters, breaking the 180 rule can confuse the audience. Did you and Mr. Kimball travel to Washington, D.C.? This scene repeatedly breaks the rule in confusing ways, moving around the court without giving any sense of the space. The jury and spectators might as well be in different rooms. But the problem is that a large scene like this one has to break the rule, because it's impossible to show the entire 360 degree space if you're stuck on one side. So how do you break the rule without confusing the audience? Let's say you want to introduce a new character in a spot the audience hasn't seen yet. How do you do it? First, you use blocking. In this scene in A Bug's Life, Hopper crosses the imaginary line by moving from the right of the frame to the left. By changing sides, he comfortably moves the imaginary line to a new position that will later include the new character. Plus, it has the added effect of making Hopper appear in control of the scene. His movement literally controls the camera. You can also use framing. We don't know it yet, but the new character shows up in the cave entrance that's now on the right side of this shot. Placing Hopper on the left side of the frame balances the camera move to the right. Finally, cement this new position by having the entire colony look from left to right. <laughs> This blocking sets up the payoff while also further reinforcing the new imaginary line. One of the layout artists for the film said this was a challenging scene to pull off because moving the line required careful choreography and framing, and when it works, we don't even notice it. This isn't a courtroom scene, but it functions exactly like one. There's a crowd of spectators, main action in the center, and it even has a surprise witness. What I'm trying to say is that all courtroom scenes have the same challenge as this one-off scene in A Bug's Life. The massive space of a courtroom packed with all its different characters means that any coherent courtroom scene requires the same laser precision from this particularly complicated scene. To Kill a Mockingbird uses the same 180 rule transitioning as A Bug's Life. At first, the camera's on one side, but Atticus crosses the line to move the camera to the opposite side. His blocking prepares us for the camera change so it feels natural, and like Hopper, it has the same subconscious effect of showing Atticus's command of the scene. The editing also prepares the viewer for new angles of the courtroom. The camera starts close between Atticus and Mayella, but once she accuses Tom, the camera moves to him, ending the back and forth and moving the imaginary line again. This small change allows the camera to include Tom in the scene and naturally transition to a new back and forth between Tom and Atticus. In many ways, a courtroom scene is a collection of smaller scenes, and the right editing and blocking can transition from one mini scene to another. Every time a main character talks to a new character, the filmmaker needs to set up a new spatial relationship, like when a lawyer goes from questioning a witness to talking to a judge. And one way to make this change is by moving the camera. Uh oh, what was that word? Uh, what word? To what? What? 
These individual techniques may seem simple on their own, but when combined, the audience gets a full understanding of the courtroom while only being able to see a small portion of it at any given time. Along with planning out the proper angles for the camera, a filmmaker also has to plan what the shots will actually look like. Some of the most iconic courtroom moments in film do come from close-ups that show an intense performance, but I think the most interesting shots are the ones that take advantage of the full space of the courtroom. When Atticus questions Mayella, the background mostly shows the white audience, but when he continues with Tom, the shots add the black audience on the second floor into the frame. Because the geography of a courtroom is so well understood, there's plenty of opportunity to frame other characters in the shot to create a more dynamic image. What is a ute? Oh, excuse me, Your Honor. Two youths. You're watching the lawyers, but if you actually think to look or, or do look, there's almost this out of focus expression in the background, which I think in a way is more effective and more moving because it does make you project a lot onto them of what you think they must be feeling or thinking. A Few Good Men does have similar frame composition, but because the drama mainly focuses on the emotions of just two people at once, the framing doesn't have the same emotional projection that happens in other courtroom scenes. The focus on two characters emphasizes the drama of the main interaction, but it comes at the expense of not always creating a strong spatial and emotional understanding of the courtroom, which means not always spending the time setting up transitions or moving the camera to change focus. In that film, the camera focuses on keeping the story moving, not necessarily to capture the emotions of all the characters in the courtroom. But for many courtroom movies, it's crucial to get that full experience right from the beginning, which is why one of the most effective tools for the courtroom is the crane shot. Crane shots are perfect for a courtroom scene. Many scenes start with a wide shot and then use the crane to move into the action. By transitioning from an establishing shot to a medium shot in a single take, the audience gets a very clear understanding of the space. And no courtroom drama takes the crane shot further than the show The People vs. O.J. Simpson American Crime Story. The cinematic style of this show directly contrast how people actually watch the OJ trial in real life. The live TV broadcast came from only one camera mounted in the corner of the courtroom. The TV dramatization instead uses the crane shot extensively to give the viewer an up-close experience of the entire trial. The crane accomplishes the same thing that blocking and editing do for other courtroom scenes. It allows the camera to move between several different perspectives within a large courtroom, but instead of a cut, it bridges those perspectives by moving the camera. The crane gives these scenes so much energy and depth, it has the ability to show the full experience extent of the courtroom, and during the show's most intense moments, the crane follows suit by moving more quickly between characters. The crane acts as an all-seeing eye that can tap into any part of the court, and because it's a miniseries, the show has more time to devote to each aspect of the courtroom. Plenty of time goes to the jury, the judge, and audience members like the Goldmans and the reporters, but even then, capturing all those characters is still a challenge. The show had to add a split screen to cover all the reactions to the verdict. While the filmmaking style starkly contrasts with the actual visuals from the TV broadcast, it better conveys the average American's experience with the OJ trial. It dominated the news for months, and most people felt like the crane camera in this scene. They peered into every detail of all the characters' lives and relationships. The People vs. OJ didn't need to dramatize this pivotal cultural moment, it only needed to show the drama that already existed. The filmmaking in The People vs. OJ shows the height a courtroom scene can reach. The criminal justice system already conveys so much human drama, so turning them into compelling cinema is only a matter of packaging the individual moments and making them legible to a viewer. It's a challenge, but when it pays off, it pays off big. Courtroom scenes are some of the most popular scenes in movies and TV. There are thousands of completely different scenes I could have looked at, but I do know they all have one thing in common. Each has to address the same problem. How do you film such a large space with so many different characters in it? The solution will vary from scene to scene, but whether it's solved through blocking, framing, or ambitious camera work, if they pull it off, it'll always be impressive. So the next time you sit down to watch a movie, try picking something with a courtroom scene, or even a large ensemble scene, just to see how they captured all the characters in the room. But with so many films to choose from, it's sometimes overwhelming to decide what to watch. So if you ever find yourself struggling with what to pick, try Movie, a curated streaming service where each and every film is hand-selected, so you'll never waste time looking for something great to watch. Every day, Movie premieres a new film that's curated by their team. They have tons of timeless classics, award-winning masterpieces, and festival fresh gems, the kind of films I definitely want to be watching. For a film with a huge ensemble cast and many large, complex set-piece sequences, try watching Richard Kelly's Southland Tales, a sci-fi film that satirizes the growing military-industrial complex and the infotainment industry. This amazing film is part of Mubi's collection of films handpicked for you. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash now you see it. That's M-U-B-I.com slash now you see it for a whole month of great cinema for free. 
A big thanks to Movie for sponsoring, and thanks to you, our patrons, for your support. If you want to support our work directly, join our Patreon. Thanks for watching.